Warning, the following contains scenes of rape and the discussion thereof. Viewer discretion is advised. You know, I've put a lot of thought into it lately, did some soul searching, looked deep within my heart of hearts, and I've come to the following conclusion. I really like Yoshiaki Kawajiri. No, I'm serious. Even if his work leans into all things schlocky and his track record on the portrayal of women in his works is a tad iffy. <laughs> Hursting is most deadly. I think Kawajiri's body of work as a whole has way more pros than it does cons. Kawajiri himself has a very fascinating biography. Born in 1950 in Yokohama, he always had artistic ambitions and wanted to initially become a manga author. But in 1960s Japan, there was not yet a school one could go to if they wanted to learn to do manga professionally. Despite being a rigorous self-taught illustrator at the time, Kawajiri always wanted to improve his skills as an artist. So after graduating high school in 1968, he got a job at Osamu Tezuka's Mushi Pro. It was there he truly discovered his love of animation because, ultimately, it was way more fun to draw pictures that had motion and sound attached to them. Deciding to stick with animation as his career, Kawajiri stuck around Mushi Pro until its closing in 1972. But instead of going to another studio like all the other Mushi Pro workers, he went with three other anime legends, Rentaro, Masao Maruyama, and Osamu Tezaki, to found their own studio that would be known as Studio Madhouse. For most of the 70s, Madhouse operated under the umbrella of Tokyo Movie Shinsha, where Kawajiri worked as a line animator. Amongst the forefathers of Madhouse, Kawajiri has always been considered the technician of the group, very detailed focused and always striving to have his art look its best. Even when he got promoted to doing writing and directing later in life, he says he always feels the most at home doing key animation. So I guess what I'm saying is that even if I may criticize some of the skeezier bits in his work, I always have a healthy respect for the man and his commitment to the craft. Which is why today, I want to talk about the Kawajiri anime that made him one of the biggest names in anime history. There's a world of darkness out there, beyond time or space. A world filled with evil that is undeniably real. And in that world, there are things that run wild. 1987's Wicked City is an animated adaptation of a novel series by Vampire Hunter D author Hideyuki Kikuchi. The story concerns Rinzaburo Taki, a lower management salaryman for an electronics company by day, but by night, he works as a secret agent for the Blackguard. You see, in this universe there exist two worlds, the human world, our world, and the Black World, an alternate dimension populated entirely by monstrous demons. For centuries, relations between both worlds have been relatively peaceful aside from terrorist attacks by radical demon groups. But the centuries-old peace treaty is up for renewal, and Taki is tasked with protecting Giuseppe Maillart, a 200-year-old mystic who will be signing the newly ratified treaty. But Taki won't be doing it alone as he has been assigned a partner, a beautiful fashion model by the name Amakie, who is a demon who works for the Blackguard on the demon world side. I'm told you're a brilliant fighter, but the facts speak a little differently. Pity. Can't say you haven't got an opinion. And so begins an action-packed supernatural thriller where Taki and Makie try to protect their charge from a group of demon supremacist radicals who super benefit from the treaty negotiations going south. But as the film goes, Taki and Makie soon begin to find out that not everything is as it seems. Wicked City is Yoshiaki Kawajiri's directorial debut. Soul directorial debut. Soul feature length directorial debut. Okay, regardless, this is the movie that made Kawajiri a global phenomenon amongst anime fans. Kawajiri had just wrapped production up on his Neo Tokyo segment, The Running Man, and was immediately asked to direct what was originally going to be a 35 minute single episode OVA adaptation of Kikuchi's novel. However, once Kawajiri and his team turned in a 15 minute test reel to the producers at Japan Home Video, they decided 35 minutes wasn't nearly enough and considerably upped the budget to make it an 80 minute feature length film. Wicked City is one of the shining examples of ultra-violent, ultra-sleazy anime of the 1980s. While such content was common in low to mid-budget titles, such extreme content being in an anime this masterfully animated was almost unheard of at the time. 
Streamline Pictures, the company that dubbed Wicked City, actually had trouble licensing it thanks to its content and the legal red tape that followed, acquiring it in 1989 but not being able to produce a dub until 1993. Wicked City is one of the great classics of the 80s, introducing Kawajiri and his style of anime to the wider world of anime fandom. But more than 30 years later, we have to ask, does this anime stand against modern scrutiny? Or in other words, what exactly do I think about it? Since this is a movie that played in the art house circuit a la Akira when it came over to the States, Wicked City did attract some attention from, from the mainstream film critic circles. And while most either didn't fully get it or were repulsed by the content, which we'll get into later, the one thing that everyone seemed to agree on was that it was a technical marvel. Wicked City is a fine example of just good ass stylized animation. Like sure, there's a few cheats here and there like stock footage, repeated character animations, and the classic character talking with their back to the camera, but it is all a means to have scenes like this. Slick, stylish, and above all else, well choreographed action scenes are the main draw of Wicked City. The root of why these scenes are not only well animated but also well shot is Kawajiri himself. Not only was he able to assemble a crack team of Madhouse's best and brightest, but it was his own skills as an artist that allowed the anime to reach its full potential. Look no further than Kawajiri's storyboards. While anime storyboards are far more refined than the roughness of American storyboards, they are still very much sketches. But the differences between Kawajiri's storyboards and the final product are almost non-existent. Experience as an animator allowed Kawajiri to produce some of the most dynamic action scenes in 80s anime. His storyboarding also allows for an attention to detail that serves Wicked City's visual storytelling. Like how Taki's demon killing gun is so powerful he is required to brace himself whenever he has to fire it, and the recoil is so strong that it leaves a dent in the wall. Then there's the character animation, specifically that of the demons. Kawajiri and his team know how to animate these otherworldly creatures so disgustingly visceral, as if these things existed in the real world, which thank god they don't. A special shout out goes to Wicked City's most well-known character, the Spider Lady. What happened to the girl? <laughs> Your concern for her is deeply touching. Well, she's alive. Don't worry, I left her asleep at the bar. An original creation of Kawajiri's, the Spider Lady is a perfect combo of ickiness and sexiness, carrying with her an alluring beauty that is wonderfully contrasted by her realistic arachnoid behavior. And I would be lying if I said I didn't contemplate tapping that in certain moments of weakness. <laughs> But Wicked City would also not be Wicked City if it weren't for its atmosphere. Being a supernatural noir story, Wicked City makes excellent use of its dark metropolitan setting. The tonal opposite of 1919, the city at night is portrayed as almost this oppressive, monolithic entity that coats its surroundings in shadowy darkness, and it makes sense that the only daytime scene in this movie is in an office where the sunlight is barely peeking through the blinds. This dark atmosphere was pulled off excellently by art director Kazuo Oga. His painted backgrounds were so impressive that it caught the attention of a director who watched the film and was able to get Oga a job on his next project. That director of course being Hayao Miyazaki, and that project being My Neighbor Totoro. Wicked City also has been credited for giving Kawajiri his trademark Kawajiri look of deep hazy blues against darker than dark blacks, and how one color can just dominate entire scenes. The aesthetic that would be used in other works such as Demon City Shinjuku, Goku Midnight Eye, and Cyber City Uedo 808. And it's even more interesting that the aesthetic itself is actually a happy accident. The reason why Wicked City and other Kawajiri works are filled with all of these oppressive blues is, is that they are a result of a coloring transfer error in the post-production that Kawajiri couldn't get fixed until the 90s, which explains why the hazy aesthetic is absent from Ninja Scroll. But also gotta give points to the soundtrack. Composed by Osamu Shoji, composition is this sort of discordant, unnatural sounding jazz soundtrack, fitting both the noir tone of the anime as well as its eldritch contents. For 
while the animation and art is exceptional in nearly every way, I found that the overall premise of Wicked City was one of its best strengths. While the anime's premise of everyday people leading secret lives as people hunting monsters from beyond the veil might come off as a little quaint these days, Wicked City, being one of the first stories to popularize it, was already taking a new spin on the idea. The idea of not just that there's a secret hell world full of demons that travel freely from their world to ours that only a slight few of the human population know about, but that relations between the two worlds are relatively diplomatic and attacks on demons by humans are basically just the actions of a few extremists, is certainly a fresh take on the whole conceit. It's also helped by Kaojuri really knowing how to adapt Kikuchi's novel into something more palatable to film, doing things such as adding more characters to better explain concepts like the character of Jean existing not only to show Makie's connection to the demon world, but also as an example of world building by showing that some demons become cyborgs in order to better assimilate with humanity, or even just simplifying the narrative. In the book, Taki has two bosses, one for his day job as a salaryman and one for his job as a blackguard. But Kawajiri decided to compress those two characters into one character, which honestly makes better sense. In fact, it's the strong writing of the characters that really keeps you engaged. Because the book that this film is based off of is what we would now call a light novel, Kawajiri decided to make use of the medium of film to expand the characterization. Taki and Makia are two characters who have excellent chemistry together. No sooner does Makia rescue Taki in their first meeting that they immediately start engaging in some witty and incredibly flirtatious back and forth. Maybe there's some other reason they love to hate you. Could it be that you're obnoxiously perfect? Thanks, I suppose I should be flattered. Let's go pick up Mr. Meyer, shall we, since he's probably arrived by now. There you go, being perfect again. It really is disgusting. And it's good that Kawajiri does this, because it makes it so that when Taki and Makia begin to naturally fall in love with one another over the course of the movie, the romance doesn't feel shoehorned. The sexual tension was there from the beginning, after all. This isn't the right sort of job for a romantic. Maybe not, but it was the right kind of job for me. But if there's one character who completely steals the show from these two, it's Giuseppe Maillard. Know why so many men are still willing to put their heads in a lion's mouth? They're little things. I hear it tastes like sheer paradise. The pleasure a man feels with any one of them is utterly beyond what you'd find with any Earth girl. Would you believe me if I told you he's actually toned down from the books? Since I am an important guest, not yet, I could make it worth your while to give me a taste of the good stuff. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> when this guy first appeared, I honestly thought I was going to hate him. From his first introduction, he looks to be the worst kind of perverted old man archetype. The kind that would make Master Roshi turn the hose on you. And yet, I found him completely impossible to hate. It could be because of his wonderful dub performance, courtesy of voice acting veteran Mike Reynolds. My, that's impressive, Grandpa. I've never seen one like it. <laughs> well, I have to keep up with the young bucks, don't I? <laughs> But I think it actually just might be that his very existence is just inherently funny. You got Taki and Makie, two characters who are designed in this way that makes them look like the ideal man and woman. And for most of the anime, they have this cartoonish wrinkled old goblin that is attached to their collective hips. There was an attempt to repeat this dynamic with Doc Wan and Ninja Scroll, but Doc Wan never had the comedic timing of Mr. Myart here. Mr. Myart? Don't point that pea shooter at me, you idiot! The enemy's behind you! But, and I'm skipping ahead a bit here, I think the reason why I can't hate my art is because he really scratches the comedic character is actually a secret badass itch that I always have. Shame the movie wasn't able to talk about his equally badass past, like when he single-handedly ended World War II by killing Adolf Hitler in a wizard's duel, and yes, that is a thing that is mentioned in the books. But, as much as I love the animation, the premise, and the characters, Wicked City is not perfect, and it has certain elements that make experiencing it a little difficult for some people. So why don't we talk about those right now? Now, I don't want to spend the entire video harping about Wicked City's portrayal of women. I don't want to end up repeating myself for my Ninja School video. But it still needs to be said that the women in Wicked City are given roles that are less than satisfactory. Oh my, it's magnificent! I swear I've gone to heaven! Please don't let me come back! I'm honored that you're so pleased. We have a long night of love ahead. What? The anime with the walking vagina lady has issues with how women are depicted? Say it ain't so, Joe! Okay, I'm actually gonna try to keep this part relatively brief. Notice I said try, so you can't fault me if I'm not successful. 
and mostly focus on the portrayal of the only named female character in this anime, Makie. Makie is introduced as someone who is equal in Taki's skill and status. Taki accepts her as his partner and is equal, and his only real hang-up has less to do with her being a woman and more to do with her being a denizen of the black world. For the life of me, I can't figure out why you're my partner. But your fighting abilities are certainly up to par. What you mean is why your partner is a woman of the black world. Good of you to mention it. I haven't had a particularly wonderful experience with them. Whatever it was, I'm sure it was merited. Uh, yeah. And despite being constantly harassed by Maillard, she has a very low tolerance for his bullshit. <laughs> Why you bitch, I'm gonna break her! Now, now, don't be rude. Makie is also a character who gets raped three times throughout the course of the story. The first by Jean, the second by a demon parasite, and finally by a gang of demons taking her hostage. Okay, to be fair, that last one is in the books, and to the film's credit, it's not played for titillation. She has her uses, however. She will serve to quench men's desires for a while. Then I will deal with her. Such terrible humiliation. But as for the other two scenes, they are shot so salaciously, so leeringly, so tailor-made for arousal, it is one shot of a pair of legs being spread wide open from becoming a hentai. Now these scenes were not in the book, and according to Kawajiri and other people who worked on Wicked City, they were purely a business decision. A mandate from Japan Home Video demanded that these scenes be put in to ensure steady sales. You see, as much as the OVA market was successful in the 80s, it was still a very volatile market in 1986. And the type of OVAs that had consistent sales during those times were, of course, the ones that build themselves with lots of violence, sexual or otherwise. So in short, Wicked City became rapier than it needed to be because capitalism is disgusting. Though if you ask me, I think a big problem with how Makie is betrayed is a lot more thematic in nature. So near the end, Taki and Makie nearly get killed by the spider lady, but are able to make it out alive. And to celebrate their new lease on life, they immediately engage in sexual congress. Now I'm able to buy this in and of itself because Taki and Makie's relationship is believable, but what I can't really abide by is the fact that after coitus, Makie begins to start showing emotions uncommon for a demon, like tears. I suppose I am. But the people of the black world aren't supposed to be able to. I'm afraid. Why am I able to cry when no one else of my race can? Ultimately, that because she had good consensual sex, she is now worthy to be considered human. But the weird Madonna whore complex stuff doesn't stop there because now we gotta talk about the twist. So it turns out that Taki and Makie weren't hired to protect Mr. Myart, but Mr. Myart was actually hired to protect them. Not to impugn your ability, but you have things all wrong. I was brought here to protect the both of you, not to have you protect my bony behind. This is because both of them have the perfect genes with one another to breed and give birth to a half-demon child in order to bring balance between the two worlds. And the capital researchers of both worlds have picked as having the best shot at making a baby, this time around at least, is you, Mackie, and your young Lothario there. That means you, Taki. But where the Madonna whore stuff comes in is at the end where Makia, implied to now be carrying Taki's child after their little tryst, ends up gaining her ultimate demon power by accepting her role as a mother. <laughs> Shave my chest and call me naked. If she's not pregnant, then I'm an anti your kid. There's a bun in that oven, make no mistake about it. Although I have to admit, I didn't think the science would appear this early in the game. <laughs> she even gets a costume change from her black suit to a virginal white dress to complete the transition from femme fatale to loyal demon bride. Wedding bells and all. Let's get our butts over to the ceremony. We've got a brand new world to make for a brand new life. <coughs> Eh, maybe I'm harping on this too much, but Kikuchi's old-fashioned thematic elements kind of rub me the wrong way. But in retrospect, it honestly could have been worse. Maki is still the one who ultimately lands the final blow on the big bad, and she doesn't even go through a drastic personality change once she starts becoming more feminine, still keeping that film fatale edge to her throughout the anime. So... points for that? But I think Wicked City's most major problems comes mostly from a structural standpoint. This being Kawajiri's first movie, so to speak, you can tell he's still trying to perfect crafting a tight narrative. And it's easy to tell that this is his first go-around because there are parts of that that feel flabby. 
The beginning and end points of the story are actually super strong and tightly crafted. The beginning sets up the atmosphere and tension, builds the world, introduces the main conflict, and assembles our cast of main characters all within the first 15 minutes. The ending executes the twist in the third act well, and ends with the climactic duel on top of a church where the main baddie gets impaled through the forehead by a crucifix, and it is awesome. <laughs> But it's the middle part of the anime that feels weak. After Maya gets attacked in the soap land and Makia gets kidnapped by the demon Parasite, Wicked City enters a second act that feels very meandering in retrospect, with the plot being less about protecting the old man and more about rescuing Makia. Now on one hand, this subplot does end up doing a lot of plot important things, like having Taki and Makie begin to realize that their relationship might go beyond just being business partners. I owe you my life. You're risking everything to save me is something I never even expected. Hey, you're my only partner. We're supposed to save each other's butts. And setting up the main bad guy, a villain so important and memorable that the anime only bothers to name him in the credits, and when asked about him, Makie just calls him some guy. So, uh, this guy with the killer elbows, you, uh, you want to tell me anything about him? We used to be together, but he changed when he joined the Radicals. He was a good man, a long time ago. But here's the thing, the main source of conflict in the second act is less, will Taki find Makie, and more, should Taki disobey his orders from his superiors and go rescue Makie? A lot of time is spent with Takie arguing with his command and Maiar that he has to go rescue Makie, knowing that doing so would be risking the mission by leaving the old man unprotected. What do you choose? Love or duty? And of course Taki rescues Makie, leading to him getting reamed by the chief and both of them getting suspended from the case. Taki, I'm very, very disappointed in you. And in spite of that, you're one of the best black guards I've ever seen, but you're too goddamn romantic. You understand what I'm saying? That alone is your one fatal flaw. But then once Taki and Makie are back in the car wondering what they should do next, Maillard appears in the back seat and the story continues like everything from the past 25 minutes didn't happen because Maillard is an integral part of the twist that's coming up in the next 5 minutes. And that's the thing. The plot twist makes the entire second act irrelevant. When you think about how Taki and Makie are the essential chess pieces in the grand plan to create a human-demon hybrid, why even have that plot line where the Black Guard is perfectly content in letting one of those important pieces be in the hands of the enemy? And Maillard, who you remember is the one who's trying to keep them safe, is okay with browbeating Taki about how he should just let Makie die because he needs to be devoted to the mission. The mission that's not the actual mission. She was supposed to give up her life, but I'm irreplaceable, goddammit. Without me in the ceremony, it's impossible to come up with a peace agreement, you pea brain. Don't you mix me up with that, that bimbo, you got it, mister? Points to him committing to the bit, I guess. The point is, is that this plotline about choosing love over one's duty is one that either needed to be excised completely, or at the very least, heavily rewritten. Because, as it stands, it just makes the whole story weaker. And because of this, I would definitely say I still prefer Ninja Scroll over Wicked City. Yeah, it's got its own problems here and there, but it's also a stronger movie with a tighter script compared to a far more looser Wicked City. But does that make Wicked City a bad movie? No, not at all. As far as film directorial debuts go, Kawajuri did quite well, making an amazingly stylized animated film that is equal parts beautiful and visceral, and he would only get better with each subsequent film. That being said, it's still hampered by the ugly, sexual violence cells that pervaded anime during those days. That, combined with some eye-roll-worthy Madonna horror theming with Makie, can make it a difficult watch for some. Still, if you were able to stomach those things, then Wicked City is still worth the watch. A fine example of how a technically-minded director and his staff can introduce the world to a better class of ultraviolence.